Welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there. To the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers, welcome. I'm really glad you're here today. How the heck are you doing? I'm re-recording this intro because I was going to start talking about the world and I decided, let's just not today. I think you're going to love this episode. It's with Victoria Albina. We talk about so much amazing stuff. We talk about what is anxiety. We talk about social and anticipatory anxiety. Victoria talks about de-armoring, perfectionism, codependency, people-pleasing, and then what happens when somebody says to you, we need to talk. <laughs> Did you have a reaction? <laughs> and I tell a little story about what happened around that recently. Victoria gives some great ways to do grounding, practical things that we can do. We end up talking about polyvagal theory. There is so much in this episode. I really think that you're going to enjoy it. And if you enjoy the episodes that I've done with Sarah Buino, Sarah introduced Victoria to me, and I just think it was a great conversation. I'm curious to know what you think. Let me tell you a little bit about Victoria. Victoria Albina, she, her, is a certified life coach and breathwork meditation guide with a passion for helping women realize that they are their own best healers so they can break free from codependency, perfectionism, and people-pleasing and reclaim their joy. She is a UCSF-trained family nurse practitioner, has a master's degree in public health from Boston University School of Public Health, oh, that was a mouthful, <laughs> and a BA in Latin American Studies from Oberlin College. Victoria has been working in health and wellness for over 20 years and lives on occupied Lenape territory in New York's Hudson Valley. And now, on to the show. Hey, Victoria, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so delighted to be here. I'm excited to have this conversation today. I always start out by asking my guests, do you identify as a highly sensitive person? Yes, I am a sensitive person. Um, mm -hmm. I have always been a tender-hearted little bunny. And my personal experience of being in either a responsive or a reactive relationship with the world has varied so much in my life. You know, there have been so many times due to so many factors where I have felt uh, a more heightened sense of se sensitivity to other people, their thoughts, their feelings, um, and have taken things more and less personally. So mm -hmm. it feels like a really variable experience within my own body. Does that resonate? Mm -hmm. It does. There are four core characteristics that Dr. Aaron defined. And so the first one is depth of processing. So we're deep thinkers. We process things deeply. We have a more active insula. So the mm. negative words associated are often we ruminate or we can't let things go. And I really like reframing it in terms yeah. of we just want to chew stuff over and think about it till we figure yeah. it out. The meaning of life, having meaning in conversations. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. That yeah. reframe is beautiful and so powerful. I was just consuming some information today about the highly sensitive person and what the information that I consumed, I'm trying to be vague so that, you know, you don't know how I consumed it. The terms that were used were negative, like the overthinking and the ruminating. And it just felt so disempowering and talking mm. about the traits as being, we don't like conflict and all of these other things. Well, there's some truth in that, but that often comes from wounding and it's really not about mm. the trait and that I'm going through some major stuff in a couple of relationships right now, and it's brutal and it hurts and it's honest and it's vulnerable. And yeah. I want to have quality relationships. And when things don't work out, I, I want to be able to talk about them. And so I really have passion about us wanting to know that we can work through uncomfortable things. Like, do I want to be in the uncomfortable stuff? Of course not. <laughs> Do I want to look at the things about me that are really difficult? No. Do I want to have quality relationships? Yes. And so having that positive reframe, I think, is so important in how we see ourselves and talk to ourselves or talk about ourselves. Yeah. 
Yeah, so agreed. My work is always about reframing the traits that I talk with my clients about. So my focus as a coach is on codependent perfectionist and people pleasing thought habits. But you'll notice I don't say codependency, mm-hmm. right? It's always the codependent habit, sure. right? It's a series of thought habits that our brilliant, amazing, incredible inner children decided were the most bestest, smartest ways to keep us safe in a world that felt less than safe or downright unsafe often. And so we learned to survive and hopefully thrive by behaving, thinking, feeling, acting in certain ways. And just like you, I'm always going to take that positive framework that these things are amazing. They are our superpowers if we choose to look at them that way. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm going to drop back to the four core characteristics since we just since I started and I didn't finish. Yeah. The O is over arousal or overstimulation. And that can be the hardest part of the trait. And that often will cause depression, anxiety. I love uh, Ariana Smith talked about like we have bathtubs that fill up very quickly because we take in so much information, but they drink Mm. incredibly slowly. Yeah, that's great. What a great metaphor. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I think that this is one of the most challenging parts of the trait, just being mindful and we can get overstimulated so easily. The third is E for emotional responsiveness or empathy. So we have more active mirror neurons. We have, like you said, tender hearts. We, you know, our, our heart, we have a very strong sense of justice. What's going on in the world right now is very challenging to see, even with COVID in the United States, because we just have not done a very good job of managing it. And for those of us that are very conscientious and very loyal and very making choices, and we see other people that aren't, it hurts our hearts because of that, you know, and, you know, the negative term would be emotionally reactive. And if we work on our wounding, We do have strong feelings about things positive and positively and negatively, and we can learn to manage those. Yes. And then the S is sensitive to subtleties. And that can be things like changes in barometric pressure can affect us. Some people have perfect pitch. We may be sensitive to caffeine or to medications. There is some sensory stuff. It's not sensory processing disorder, but we notice things that other people don't. We may notice if somebody's uncomfortable and they need to have the window open bright lights, loud noises. We tend to not like being startled. We don't like watching violence. Not everybody. There's variation, but that's kind of a summary. We tend to be very creative. We're the poets, the teachers, the healers, the justice makers of the world. I I think there are so many strengths. And because of wounding, and if you're a human, life is messy and uncomfortable. And I don't care who you are, nobody's living a perfectly charmed life. Yeah. 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 Thank you for detailing all of that. It's such a, I again, love how you consistently are always looking for the positive and the ways that we can recognize um, what may be part of, you know, how we came to this planet and what is wounding. Because when we see these things, not as necessarily the fixed trait, but um, yeah, the ways that what is beautiful within us may have shifted in response to life. Yeah. And if we see it as something that shifted, well, my goodness, we can shift it back. Right. So much of how we are is it was adaptive that we had to do what we do to survive. Had we not done that, we would not have survived. And so the traits are not, and I'm not talking about HSP traits, but whatever it is that we do to survive, it's not that it's adaptive or maladaptive, but when we have a choice to choose, is this working or not working and come back to what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What am I needing? What am I believing? That's when we get freedom. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. Well, <laughs> like we talked about talking about anxiety and we are going to talk some about codependency, but let's, let's go back to anxiety. And with your background, can you tell me a little bit about how you perceive anxiety and how you frame it and what it's about? Well, you know, there's always the clinical definition, right? Like the the points on the scale that get you that diagnosis of anxiety. The way I sort of, to take a sort of somatic bodily based experience of it, I think of the sensations of uh, heart rate elevation, sort of a racing feeling like your blood is racing, like your body is revved up, right? Like you've had one too many espressos. Um, I think of my, <laughs> I'm a total dork. So here we go. Um, that episode of The Office where Michael buys an espresso machine. <laughs> 
And these folks in Scranton who's never had espresso are just like chugging it and they're racing around the office, right? Everything's heightened. Your senses are heightened. Your responses are heightened. You're more reactive. You're in worry. You're in analysis paralysis. Everything feels more intense than it maybe would had you not had that internal fifth espresso to stay with our mixed metaphors here. (laughs) So, um, yeah, that's sort of how I think of anxiety of that, that revved up state. Yeah. I also, for me, it's, it's anticipatory worry. Sure. A lot of anticipatory worry. And I just started uh, the new, the new round of the HSP online courses. And we were talking about some of the people that showed up yesterday said that they really had a lot of anxiety before, but then when they showed up, that dropped. And so some of us get anxious, you know, when something happens, we get anxious both times or that anticipatory anxiety of what if I can't find it? What if I get lost? What if I can't log in? What if it's the wrong time? Right. Right. Yeah. And I think social anxiety is that same thing, right? What will they think of me? Mm -hmm. Um, Which I often in my work find is a bit of a cover up job for what will I think of me? Mm -hmm. Will I say something and people may react any way they do, but will I beat myself up for it? Right. That's the real worry is how we will treat ourselves in any given moment. Well, I think too, some of that is, will I fit in and will I belong? And most people that are highly sensitive because we're 15 to 20% of the population, maybe 30%, I heard Dr. Aaron say, we're still in the minority and we have that sense of just feeling odd and not fitting in and not belonging. And when we don't know that I'm uncomfortable and you're uncomfortable and I try and have a conversation with you and it doesn't go anywhere, it may not be because there's something flawed with me. It may be that, and I don't mean this personally to you, but you know, you may not have the skills and you may be awkward, but I make it about me. So Right. Until we're able to tease that apart, then I walk right. away going like, see, I'm a loser. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think our society and culture, think about the movies and books and TV shows we watch, paint this picture of awkward people like it's something really bad. But again, I think all these things can be our superpowers. I actively on my podcast call my listeners my nerds with love because nerds love nerds. Mm-hmm. And like, it's a beautiful thing, right? Right. right. Yeah. When we have that intimacy in relationships to talk about the awkwardness, that's when the magic really begins. And it's the thing that we think that we're not supposed to talk about at all that really creates that sense of closeness. When I let you see that I don't have all my stuff together and I'm messy and I'm flawed and you go like, oh, I'm messy and flawed too. Yeah. There's just this beautiful connection. That's true vulnerability, right? Yeah. And sitting in that discomfort and and learning to get comfortable with the discomfort of disclosure and the discomfort of not knowing if the other person will react or respond in the way you wish, but knowing you have your own back. That's that vulnerability with self that lets those important conversations you're talking about happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I talk with people in terms of, you know, we need to do testing. Right. So if if something happens and we're friends and you say something that hurts my feelings, I, I kind of want to test and see if I let you know that that hurt my feelings. Are you going to be able to hear me? Are you going to be able to respond? Are you going to get defensive? And I kind of want to find out now than later before I'm really invested in the relationship. And when we have that sense of I deserve to be seen and heard. And if you're not able to do that, then I'm not going to fully bring my heart to the relationship because you're you're not you don't have the skill set that's important to me to have that deep connection that I'm capable of. Right. And I love, once again, what I'm hearing you doing is being very thoughtful with your wording. You don't have the skill set, right? So often I find that when we, as a humanity, feel sensitive, tender, vulnerable, right? Like our tender underbelly is showing. It's so easy to cast aspersions and to be like, well, he's a jerk. And I think it's so much more loving for self and other, and it's so much more healing for the world to use the kind of thoughtful language you just used. So thank you for modeling that. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's lovely. You're welcome. Yeah. So we were going to talk about an anxiety, but it doesn't feel like we're really landing there. (laughs) We can, we can get back into anxiety. I mean, it's, it's a big thing. I was a primary care provider in New York City for many years. Anxiety is very, very real, right? (laughs) Right. I'd love to start a little bit there. I I really like the idea of talking about codependency yeah. and more of what we're talking about. I 
think the challenge is because I don't talk about anxiety a whole bunch, I'm a little bit clueless as to where to start and what to ask you. Yeah. Can I put the onus on you? Yeah, let's see where we go. <laughs> so I think we've talked about some really important tenets here, right? The concept of anticipatory anxiety, social anxiety, anxiety that is born from worrying what others will think about us and what we will think of ourselves, how we'll judge ourselves. There is not a day of my work life that passes that I don't say to someone, if beating yourself up worked, it would have worked by now, darling. Right? And yet, there are these scripts in our brains, right? Like old computer programming that tell us we need to do everything perfectly. And if we don't, we're a failure and that's a bad thing. Right? And that will then beat ourselves up for that apparent misstep. And I think that can be that kind of a script, that perfectionist script, I often see in my clients as the source of so much anxiety because we end up putting so much pressure on ourselves to meet up to some kind of impossible standard for humans, right? To always say the right thing, always have the smart comment, always remember the reference, always be able to explain it or like be smooth in some moment when we're just not feeling smooth, right? And so that anxiety then comes into people's work lives. Again, I think of codependency, perfectionism, and people pleasing are often the root cause when our framework for judging ourselves is the validation and approval of others, when we've lived a whole life believing that it was a number one, our job to manage other people's emotions for them, manage their wellness, manage their mental state, their physical state, their lunch, right? Take care of everything for everyone else and be so other focused. Of course, that's anxiety inducing. That That is an awful lot to put on a tiny set of human shoulders, Right. And so it's it's perfectly logical that thinking you have to manage other people's lives for them would create anxiety because who on earth can measure up to that? Right. I want to drop back and have you repeat what you said. If beating yourself would have worked. If beating yourself up worked, it would have worked by now. My love. Yeah. And yet we walk around the world thinking right? I'll get myself to go to the gym if I tell myself my body's terrible. I'll eat better if I tell myself I'm a bad person if I enjoy pizza, right? We tell ourselves, oh, you have to do better in this social interaction or you're a loser. But that's not nervous system science, right? It's not how brains work. When we do that, we activate the sympathetic system, that part of our nervous system that is the fight or flight system, Our bodies get flooded with adrenaline, norepinephrine, eventually cortisol, and we are not in our right minds. And and I mean that literally. When you are stressed out, when you are anxious, when you are feeding into that system, and we'll talk about other etiologies, other um, sources of anxiety. I don't want anyone to hear this and hear that it's victim blaming, or I'm saying you just did this to yourself because no, babies, no, 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 no. And... When you are in that cycle, your body gets activated. It thinks a lion is coming. And when the lions come, they will eat you and your friends and the whole village and literally everything will be lost. But studies show that very few average Americans are being chased by lions these days. We love our research, right? Mm -hmm. And yet we respond to a text from our boss, a call from our mom, someone we love saying we need to talk as though we were literally being attacked by a lion. And I I don't mean metaphorically, I mean literally, Mm -hmm. right? Physiologically, Mm -hmm. we respond as though it's the actual end of the earth. And so in that moment, what you want your body to do is not to think, not to digest, not to create thyroid hormone, not to have a healthy period. Mon Dieu, do not do that. Pump that blood to your heart, to your lungs. So fast, faster. We have to run. My fingers are numb. I can't feel my nose. My brain is a a fuzzy mess. I am anxious in this moment. And that's what you're supposed to do. Your body is having the correct physiologic response. So in those moments, we get to find that wellspring of self-love to accept that our bodies are doing the correct thing. 
in response to our circumstances and our thoughts about them. So we start with that self-love. Okay, I'm feeling this. This is the correct response. It is extremely unpleasant. Like, I want to call 911. This is horrifying. And it is what my body is supposed to do. Nothing has gone wrong. And from there, we get to work backwards to find resources within ourselves to bring us back into what's called ventral vagal, which is part of our parasympathetic nervous system, which has two branches. In the parasympathetic, that's broadly rest and digest. Within ventral vagal, we are safe, secure, calm. How I feel talking to you in this moment, right? We make eye contact with other humans or animals, right? Which can be challenging, you know, along a neurodiverse spectrum. If that's available, that's a beautiful thing to bring us back. If that's not available, fantastic. We can use things like hugging ourselves. We can remind ourselves of a time when we were safe and go back to that safety in our minds, that resource, that internal resource. We can think of a loved one, a grandparent, an auntie. We can picture the family dog who was tender and slept in our bed. We can look out our window and yes, you can do this in Brooklyn and connect with a tree, with mother nature, with Pachamama and bring yourself home. So physiology is a mental process, a physical process, a spiritual process. And there's so many tools that we can have to bring ourselves home. And that for me is the work of overcoming anxiety is to get into relationship with it and out of that adversarial, everything, the way you've been talking about loving our traits, loving our parts, right? Seeing them as superpowers, My goodness, baby, your body can prepare you to escape a lion, to fight it or flight it. And wow, that is beautiful. Yeah, I love that. It's so funny. I wrote down that I need to talk to you and how many of us have that, you know, I need to talk to you. And when I have twin boys and when they started driving, we told them, if you get into an accident, you call us, you need to say, I got into an accident and I'm okay. And one of my sons had something happen and he went into this long winded thing. And my husband and I are on speakerphone. And we're just like, well, like, are you okay? Are you okay? And just the other night, my son and I were texting and I said, can I call you? He said, I'm, I'm not home. I said, call me when you get home. And he said, is everything right. okay? And I said, you're wired just like your mother. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. But I think that there's a way that. I know that that's just how I'm wired. I know that's where my mind goes. And for me to go like, yep, that's just how it is. I I say to my kids all the time, like, you know, I'm your mother and and I'm anxious or I worry about you and I'm really good at it. It doesn't mean that it overtakes me, but I know that that's the way my mind is going to go to the most conservative kind of fearful thought without, without me having control over it. Then I can always bring it back and use what I know to be true. But I'm also not going to deny that that's just how I'm wired. And then to see that kind of come up in my son, like, is everything okay? It's like, yeah, you're just like your mama. We're good. Thanks. Cutie, cutie. Yeah. And for me, the work is about um, sort of attenuating that response, right? So yes, it is normal and natural and human when someone says, I was in a car accident to go to... (gasps) are you dead? Are you calling me from the great beyond? <laughs> right. right. And to let our brains, um, our, our reptilian brains, our lizard brain run the show. And by learning somatic modalities, body-based modalities, understanding our nervous system and learning how to manage our adult mind, which are the three legs of, of the practice that I teach my clients, we can learn to be our own watcher and to know my brain will go to there to step into acceptance, to say, like you just did, that's fine. That's okay. And to, to reduce the amount of reactivity. Yeah. So that our bodies are less flooded with adrenaline, cortisol, norepinephrine, right? We're getting less of that physiologic response, which then of course, when that response happens, of course your thoughts are going to follow, right? So working on all three angles to find that safe home where you don't need to panic. You can simply ask, are you okay? Yeah, exactly. Beautiful. Exactly. Beautiful. And I think that's where mindfulness is so important. But if we're in that place where we hate how we respond and then we go into 
an emotional reaction and then we get angry at ourselves for reacting. And then we get angry that we reacted, that we're angry. It just sets that whole spinning up. And if we're hardwired to kind of automatically have a response, then we go like, oh, I went there again. Okay. What do I need to do to pull back to center? That that's a way to use mindfulness and not change how we're wired. And I find that people talk, especially, you know, I, I just, like I said, had two groups start this week. So we did a lot of talking about what were people's expectations. And a couple of people said, I want to live with more ease and have joy. And I had to say, like, I have some good news and bad news for you, that if you're expecting that you will come out of this and not be sensitive, oh. and that will lead you to living with joy and ease, you were in the wrong place, and you're going to be really upset. But it's really about learning to lean into what happens. So when it happens, we go like, what do I need to do? How can I lean into this? What are the tools to be present to it? And that's how we end up being okay with it. It's about being in the process and not looking to get the joy and the happiness. That is the result of being present to whatever that process is, even when it's uncomfortable. Agreed. Agreed. The framework I teach is awareness, acceptance, and then action. Right. And so often we want to jump to action. Well, I want to change this habit. Well, my love, slow your roll, baby. Slow it on down. Right. Most of us aren't even aware. You know, I talk about the habits that I help folks to overcome as being quite sneaky and insidious. Right. Most folks don't even realize that they're in a perfectionist thought fantasy or that they're people pleasing instead of taking care of themselves or that they're functioning through a thought habit, a behavioral habit that is codependent in its nature. Right. Trying to take care of others instead of ourselves. And so we need to bring that awareness. Like you just said, what am I doing when? Why? What is my true goal and intention to which I'll hear like, oh, I just want him to be happy. Okay, let's pull it back a little bit. Is it actually that you believe you will be happy if you make someone else happy? Is it even a further inner child step backwards to an even younger age? You believe you will be safe in this world if you keep him happy. So raising all that awareness and then acceptance. Because when we fight with facts, we lose. Always. Right. Always. Can you talk about some practices to help us get back in our bodies? For me, I really had to be in my head to survive. And i it's an ongoing challenge for me to remind myself to be present and to take time and breathe and do grounding and to really come back into my body because there's a lot of trauma in there. And for many of us that have deep feelings, we were kind of told to keep it under wraps. And so we just kind of shut down. So many of us tend to be very intellectual. And I think the healing really comes from learning how to get back in our bodies and have safety in our bodies. So can you talk about some things that we can do? Yeah, absolutely. Getting back in one's body is work that must be titrated. So to titrate is to add the challenging thing drop by drop and wait to see what the response or reaction is from your mammal, from your physiology, from your body, and not to just pour a bucket of de-armoring in, right? So my clients too are often come from households that were quite chaotic, a lot of stress, distress, or trauma. And so the idea of shavasana at yoga, horrifying. Mm -hmm. The idea of seated meditation, forget about it. Right. And I spend a not insignificant part of my time telling people, please do not meditate. Please, 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 please. I beg of thee as someone whose life goal is to help folks to get more present. Please do not try to do a seated meditation. Because when our bodies are easily flooded into that sympathetic state or into the state known as dorsal vagus, which is the second part of the parasympathetic system, that is immobilization, freeze. That is deer in the headlights, possum playing possum, depression. The, oh, I, I don't know. We'll do whatever you want. That's that like, I just can't, right? Fully overwhelmed. And so when our our physiology, when our nervous system tends to run towards sympathetic or to dorsal, forcing ourselves to be in that quiet, lying down, very physically vulnerable space, mm, no thank you. And so instead, what I'll invite people to do is to gently de-armor. So de-armoring comes from the framework of recognizing where we're armored. So I think of a boxer 
ready to fight, right? Arms in tight, chin tucked down, body is tense, ready for the next blow. For some of us, that was physical. For many, it was emotional. It doesn't matter. If you're carrying that armoring within you, then that armoring often comes from, for my clients, a childhood of walking on eggshells, feeling always criticized, or never getting attention, right? Particularly not the positive, supportive attention they wanted and really feeling like they had to grasp and grasp and prove and prove and prove to get love. So from there, we carry so much tension in the body. Often in the hips, um, we carry fight or flight and in the jaw um, too as well, right? If we wanted to speak a lot as children, we wanted to talk back, but we knew that that was an either emotionally or physically dangerous, we hold that tension in. And it's funny, I've surveyed my clients who come to me for support to overcome codependency and that TMJ, that joint pain, that jaw pain and hip pain are very, very common. So what it is, is it's mobilization energy. The body wants to move. It wants to, right? If you're chased by a lion, you run and you run and you run and you get, you burn up all that adrenaline, you can come back to a neutral state. Well, as humans, particularly small ones, you can't yell back at the grown-up. It stays stuck inside. Or you want to physically or emotionally run away and you can't, so it stays stuck inside. So starting to bring gentle awareness. Where is there tension in my body? Where am I holding? And to start, just start there and stop there. Please do not push it. Please, 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 especially if you are a highly sensitive person, I just don't want anyone to take this as a call to overwhelm or flood themselves. So just noticing the tension. You have no job here other than being your watcher. You don't need to release it. You don't need to shift it. Notice. The thing with noticing is it brings more noticing, right? It brings more and more awareness. So then notice when I'm at work and my talking to my boss, where am I holding tension? When I'm on the couch relaxing, there's a puppy on me, my favorite show is on, where am I holding tension? When I'm cooking, when I'm cleaning, when I'm walking, when I'm reading, what is my body saying to me? And so it's about getting into a gentle conversation with our bodies. Would it be supportive to share from a nervous system framework what I recommend for panic or freeze? Yeah, that would be great. Fantastic. So when we feel that flooding... That moment where we're getting more and more anxious and our breathing gets a little higher up in the chest and we're starting to, okay, I'm getting flooded with anxiety heading towards panic. What we want to do is to slow the world down because our bodies are once again trying to speed the world up. So we pause and we do something called orienting. So orienting is where I would start. And I actually have a free uh, resource here. I've recorded... um, I call it a meditation, but don't worry, it's not. It's a guided experience of orienting, and you can get that right on my homepage at victoriaalbina.com. So orienting is when we find ourselves in the time and place where we are in. So some simple things to do would be uh, to explore your, your clothing. Okay, so this sweater has several textures, right? We're grounding ourselves without needing to call it that. There's a seam here. I feel the ridge on my finger, All right? Start to bring ourselves into this present place because our brains are racing miles ahead. Um, holding a hot cup of tea so the heat will show you. So think about it evolutionarily. When do the lions come? Well, they come at night, right? Because they can see then and we can't. When the sun goes down on the savanna, it's immediately very, very cold. So if you hold something hot like a cup of tea, run your hands under warm water, please don't burn yourself, that can help your body to experience, okay, I'm warm. What happens when warm? Okay, the village is awake. The guys with the spears, they're right there. The sun's out. The lions aren't. I am safe. A hot shower, a hot bath, right? This is part of why we give little children a warm bath before bed. Lavender. So lavender is a calcium ion channel opening agent. That is fantastic news because it does a similar thing to a benzodiazepine drug, a Xanax, right? A Valium, something that calms the nervous system. So if anxiety is one of your preset, right? The knob, right? Controls in your mind and your body, 
carry lavender. You can get a little roller, just carry the bottle, use a lavender soap or have the lavender around in your setting so that you can smell it. And really um, smelling things, the first cranial nerve, the olfactory nerve sends it whoosh, right into your brain, calms the body. Fine motor skills help us to remember that we're safe. So I'll put my hand in front of me and I'll touch my thumb to each finger while counting. One, two, three, four. Now back, four, three, two, one. So when we engage with fine motor skills, the brain understands you can only do that if you're not under attack. Wrapping yourself in a warm blanket, a weighted blanket, if that works for your physiology, or do gentle movement to bring warming energy into the body. But, but when it's, when we're in anxiety, panic, stress, overwhelm, that needs to be gentle. So a gentle stretch, a stroll versus a brisk walk. We're going to talk about brisk walks in a second. And then the last thing that can be helpful for some physiology, but maybe too much for others. So like you said, do your A-B testing is shaking. So sometimes when that energy, that stress activation uh, energy is within us, shaking our hands, shaking our whole bodies can help to release it. If this is new to you and you don't know how you'll respond, try one little hand for five seconds. Check in. Was that nice? If it was nice, do it some more. If it was no good, you learned something beautiful. That's great. So then for a freeze, when we're in dorsal, when we're immobilized, when we, I'm so overwhelmed, I don't know what to do. I'm so blue. I don't know what to do. When we're in the, I don't know. I don't know what's next. I don't know how to get out of this. And this can often happen uh, after anxiety, right? So if we get way too flooded and don't have the skill set yet to bring ourselves back into ventral vagal, we can drop down into dorsal, which is totally fine. And right, none of these states are bad or good. They're just what's happening. So for that freeze, perhaps counterintuitively, we want to bring in more freeze. So chewing um, ice, drinking something cold, running cold water on your hands or particularly on your wrists or the antecubital fossa, like the little inner part of your elbow where you would test a baby bottle. Um, They're just places where there's a lot of vasculature of blood moving there. And so it'll cool you pretty quickly. So a little cold water here. Orienting to your environment is also really great. And there I would love in a freeze, what I love to do is give my brain something that's very task oriented. So we did fine motor skills in panic, task oriented in freeze. So I may look around my environment and give my brain a job to bring it back into a more alertness. So counting by color, counting by shape. So uh, let's pick squares. So there's a calendar in front of me. I see hundreds of squares. Um, there is a bookcase. I see it has four squares to it. I see a picture in a square frame. There's another square, right? You could do circles. It's irrelevant, but the job is to give your brain a job. And then finally for freeze, we want to bring in gently, gently that activation energy. So this is when shaking may be awesome as well, or taking a brisk walk, right? Or or moving in a faster way that lets our body know, baby, it's okay to have some activation right now. But again, we want to go very slowly because we can overexcite the body and shoot ourselves from dorsal right into freaking out again. And I say freaking out as someone who's had panic attacks. I say it only with love and care, right? Um, because that kind of language makes me smile, which reminds me that a smile is possible. So we don't want to freak ourselves out. Gentle, gentle. Test it and see what works for you before you're in full-blown dorsal or that that panic freaked out energy. So I have a question for you. It's the million-dollar question. My default is I get stuck in dorsal and I know I'm in dorsal. I know I'm stuck in dorsal. I am resistant to being in dorsal. I know it would help. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I get so freaking stuck. Mm. Yeah. May I ask some follow-up questions? Sure. Where does that dorsal live in your body? Hmm. I'm feeling tightness in my chest, but I'm wanting to say it's my gut, but I I honestly don't know. 
that's okay. You don't need to know. Yeah. Would you like to explore through your gut or through your chest? Feel into it. Um, my chest, I'm feeling tearful as we're doing this, which I'm yeah. totally okay with. Yeah. It feels like it's very young. It, what feels like it comes up is you're not the boss of me. You can't make me. Oh. And what it feels like is that I'm really wanting someone, yeah, the tears are coming, everybody. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah. So please don't worry about me. It feels like I want somebody to co-regulate with me Yeah, of course. and there's nobody co-regulating. And so yeah. I just go into a freeze mode. Yeah, that's a perfectly natural, normal thing for a mammal to do. And thank you for honoring that with me in this moment. So the invitation then would be to ask yourself and to ask that energy in your chest, Mm -hmm. what does it need to feel supported, to feel co-regulated? Because we can co-regulate with ourselves, right? We can bring in our resources to achieve that energetic state. It's interesting that I go into such an angry place when this happens mm. that I'm just so mad that nobody was there and how overwhelmed and alone I felt. Yeah. And I've described it as almost like shadow boxing that nobody's there. And that part of me feels so young and I just want somebody else to come in and fix it. And so like when you said like I can co-regulate with myself, it's like, huh? I mean, there are times when I feel like I'm very good at being very present for myself. And when I get into this dorsal state, man, but go ahead. Yeah. So I, the reason I teach adults how to manage their minds, one of the big things is so we can show up for our inner children Mm -hmm. as an adult who knows what we're thinking and feeling and needing and the actions we take feel aligned. And so I always remind myself that I'm a really good parent for me, right? I show up, I wake up, I have clean sheets, I eat healthy food that feels good for my body, not declaring I know what healthy is, right? Food that is supportive for me. I drink nice tea, you know, I put on shirts and go on podcasts. I'm a really great parent for me. And so by by really reinforcing that neural groove, that understanding of myself in the moment when I am ventral vagal already, which is when I recommend that we do this work, right, of supporting ourselves somatically and cognitively, when everything's feeling really nice, mm-hmm. is when we do this work of reminding ourselves so that it can take hold neurologically and create a new neural groove, a new understanding, a new mm-hmm. pathway. So, yeah, just reminding your perfect self that you know how to show up for you. And then I wonder, you know, are there external resources, internal resources, really, Mm -hmm. but any other being that you can bring in to co-regulate with you, right? Like that understanding of that grandparent figure, that great teacher, camp counselor, the librarian, Yeah. So I'm struggling a little bit as I'm hearing you talk in that it feels like when I get into this state, I get so identified with what's going on. It feels like it's a trauma response and that when I'm not having a trauma response, I feel like I have amazing skills to manage, but it feels like I get often get so identified. Even if I can say I'm identified, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do, that it just feels like there's no adult on board. Right. Right, right. And I know we didn't talk about going here. So I I also like, (laughs) I feel like I'm a hard nut to crack. And so I don't want this to be like a setup for you because obviously if I would have been able to sort this out, I would have before now. Well, thank you. So I guess I'm just wanting like consent from you that we kind of went down a path and I just want to make sure you're okay. Yeah. So it, it does sound like a trauma response. And that is where in my work as a coach, also as a nurse practitioner, in seeing someone having that kind of a response or a reaction, I would encourage going to that non-judgmental place and seeking further support, right? So the support of a trained trauma therapist, EMDR, a different sort of modality other than coaching to help um, help you, help my client to get the care that they want, need, and deserve to come into a different relationship around that trauma response. 
Yeah. And we had paused for a minute to just sort of talk offline because I feel like this is a place where I really get over identified that for the most part, I'm able to manage very well in my life. I mean, things are uncomfortable, but I've got great skills and there's something around this that I can see that I'm really identified and it feels like there's no adult on board. And, and I think it is, I think if it was something I could get myself out of, I, I would have because I've got a good set of tools. So if, anybody is identifying with this, we're talking about a trauma response right. here. And so right. you need to work with somebody who specializes Absolutely. in trauma. Yeah. 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 I haven't talked about polyvagal theory. So can we take a step back and just, can you do oh, an sure. overview about polyvagal so that we know what the different vagals are? <laughs> <laughs> the many vagals of your mind. Um <laughs> So as humans in this moment of our evolution, we are blessed with many a vagal. Um, and there are three, in fact. And so this is based on the work of Dr. Stephen Porges, PhD, who uh, wrote the actual book on this. Uh, and I want to flag if anyone wants to nerd out harder. I highly recommend the work of Deb Dana. She's a social worker, meaning she has a magical skill for making complex things into understandable things. So Deb Dana's my gal on uh, polyvagal. I, do all of her courses. She's incredible. So many of us learned that we had fight or flight, arrest and digest. So there's two parts to the nervous system. Sympathetic, which we talked about earlier as that fight or flight, freak out, lions coming, ah, run part of our brain's bodies. All of this is managed, I should say, by the 10th cranial nerve, the longest cranial nerve that runs the length of our entire bodies called vagus because it from the Latin to wander. And I love that. It just wanders our whole bodies running the show in many ways. So one branch is sympathetic. The other is parasympathetic. And parasympathetic then has two branches, which are ventral vagal, which refers ventral is the front of the body, and dorsal vagal, which is the back of the body. And so the ventral vagal system is, to put it quite simply, that's the safe and secure, safe and social connected. And then the dorsal vagal, I remember door, dorsal, your back is against the door of the cave. You have exhausted all other options. And so you're just sort of barricaded within yourself to try to keep yourself from dying. As humans, we are pack animals and we are wired for connection, which is a beautiful thing to remember. So in pretty much any situation, humans will try to stay in ventral vagal and get the other one into ventral vagal. So I often think of like a mugging, right? Most people are like, oh, dude, cool, 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 cool. Take my wallet, take my purse. Here, do you want my phone? Oh, wait, I have my car key. Like, we're cool though, right? Like, just take my stuff. No need to hurt me. We're cool, cool, right? 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 So we seek that social connection while sympathetic's coming on board and we're backing away right? We're trying to get ourselves to safety. If that doesn't work, that's when sympathetic gets activated. Um, we go into that fight or flight. If that doesn't work, we go into dorsal. Um, and that is that collapse state. And so when you were mentioning co-regulation, all these nervous system states exist within us literally all the time, all day long. Without each of them, we wouldn't have a restful sleep without dorsal. We wouldn't have um, the get up and go to put on your pants without sympathetic. And we ha wouldn't have the connection with other humans, mammals, the earth, ourselves without ventral vagal. So I, I need to keep saying this very clearly. None of these states are bad. None of them are like optimal. You're not a better person if you're in ventral more. No, 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 my love. You would have no pants without sympathetic. <laughs> and so the work is to, again, find that safe way to be in each of those, not so sympathetically activated that you're dissociated from life, nor so dorsally activated you're dissociated from life, but finding a way to be present in each of the states to recognize when that's just not happening and to use your resources and your tools to regulate your nervous system in each of those states, to work your way towards, notice I didn't say get back to, Work your way back towards ventral vagal, getting into connection with yourself or others. And so the theme of co-regulating is when our nervous systems regulate with another human animal being uh, or a thought in our mind. So we can regulate. A client of mine regulates with Dr. Maya Angelou. She's very connected with her. And when she feels stressed, overwhelmed, worried, anxious, 
she has a conversation in her own mind and body with Dr. Angelou, and that helps her to co-regulate. That can also be with a pet, with a nice person, right? Or with, again, a tree out your window, with the earth itself. Love that. I love that. Victoria, I'm looking at time and we need to wrap up. We didn't even get to codependency. Oh, man. Is there anything that you didn't talk about that's important to mention before we wrap up? Well, I think one of the most central teachings that has changed my life and is the thing I look to teach everyone or share with rather, uh, everyone with whom I work is that healing is a process. It's not linear. There will be ups and there will be downs as with the nervous system. And the more you can really focus on building trust and love with and within yourself, the more joyful, peaceful your life will be. And the more you're able to support yourself when you're in the discomfort, right? So if we take the stoicist view that life is 50-50, 50% joy, 50% suffering, the suffering is a lot less lousy when you are loving yourself through it, accepting life as life happens and not fighting it, which only creates further suffering. So if I had one thing to say to folks, it would be learn how to have your own back and to trust yourself to do so. I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you. Victoria, where can people find you? Tell us your website, your socials, you have a podcast. So, and all of this will be in the show notes at unapologeticallysensitive.com. Just find Victoria's episode and click on it. Or if you're listening in an app that has show notes. Perfect. So my website is victoriaalbina.com. And again, those free meditations, orienting exercises, grounding exercises are available right there on the homepage just for you. Uh, on social media, I'm at Victoria Albina Wellness on the gram. Um, and my podcast is called Feminist Wellness. And it's free and available every Thursday, literally everywhere you get podcasts. So check that out. Um, and I also have a six month program called Overcoming Codependency, in which I blend all of these things that I love to nerd about, um, all the witchiness, all the woo, all the science, um, nervous system, cognitive modalities, and of course, somatics connecting in with the body. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah. Victoria, thank you so much for being here today. This has just been delightful. Yeah, it really has been. Thank you so much. And may I share just one last thing with your audience? Sure. Your girl here is putting a lot of work into this podcast. She is doing an amazing job. And I would like to invite you to head on over to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this show, Unapologetically Sensitive, as a way of helping more people to find this. Because if 15 to 30% of the population is a highly sensitive person, this podcast needs to get in their ears. And she did not ask me to do this. She has this smile on her face because she did not expect this. But it's really important to help the show get seen and heard and really to help others to heal. So take a moment to do that, please. Oh, thanks very much. My pleasure. You do great work. Thank you. You too. Have a great day and I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey again. So what'd you think? There's a lot of good meaty stuff in there. I really enjoyed doing this interview. I think what I especially love about this interview is she does such a beautiful job of explaining what goes on in our body, what we can do, why it's going on. I love being able to have practical things that y'all can get by the time you're done listening to an episode. So thank you so much, Victoria. I really love this episode. Really, I don't have a lot to say. I'm reluctant to talk about what's going on in the world because we are today when we're recording, it's the 13th of January. Not really sure what the rest of the month has to hold. I'm just really going to trust that we will get through this. <laughs> the new online HSP courses started this week, and it's really interesting. They are fuller than they've ever been before. I really love all the beautiful people that are signed up. And the first week we talk about why did you take the course and what are you expecting to get from the course? And I just thought what I might do as we go through the 10 weeks of this online HSP course is I may share with you little nuggets that come up. People wanted connection, validation, to understand more about the trait, learning to reframe how they understand the trait, 
reducing resistance, managing overstimulation, that sense of feeling like they're not enough, that concern of feeling like they take up too much space, wanting friendship. So many people really talked about really wanting to have connection and a community, having more coping mechanisms, learning to live with more ease, learning to show up for myself, learn, grow, connect. It's so interesting to see the commonalities and what I'm seeing the more that we do these online HSP courses. And I think people listen to previous podcast episodes. If you're a first time listener to the podcast, if you go to my website at unapologeticallysensitive.com, there's a tab that says HSP groups. And I teach these 10 week courses. We talk about perfectionism, boundaries, mindfulness, turning the negatives into positives, into your superpowers. And I think as people have heard, other participants share on podcast episodes their experience. I'm just seeing that the people that are coming to take the course are really just ready to dig in and grow. And it generally takes a couple of weeks for people to warm up and just a beautiful sense of connection. I'm just really pleased. The next online courses will start the first week in April. So if you're interested, yeah, the information is on my website. <laughs> I'm still a little rambly with COVID. And I figured that I'm going to give myself a two-year post-COVID excuse for the brain fog. So I figure I'm covered for a couple of years and then I'm gonna have to come up with something after that. I wanted to share something really exciting with you. Melissa, <laughs> we had a long conversation about her last name. My brain always has to pause. Melissa Childs has helped me set up an online store that has podcast logo. Some of it says unapologetically sensitive. Some of it says unapologetically sensitive logo. No, no, it's this unapologetically sensitive podcast. Anyways, Shelly, you don't have to take this stuff out. Let's just let's just get real and get human here. There are hoodies and t-shirts and scarves and hats and bibs, all kinds of things. If you are interested in walking around being unapologetically sensitive for the month of January 2021, there is a special coupon code to get 10% off all merchandise as much as you want to order. The code is HSP0121. It's in January 21st. So HSP0121. You can go in and enter the code. We are still doing some tweaking on which items are working and aren't working. If you, I mean, everything that's in there is fine. I've been doing reveals on TikTok and Instagram if you want to see what the products look like. I'm hoping that I'll have some pictures up on my website soon of the actual products. For the most part, I think that they're really great and a handful of people have ordered merchandise and are sending me pictures of what it looks like. If you buy something and you want me to put a picture of you and your what you're wearing on my social media, send me a picture, give me permission, and I am more than happy to show what you're all buying and what you're wearing. You can go to patriciayounglcsw.com and there's a tab there that says store and you can order merchandise. My hope is that you're doing well, that you're taking time for yourself. If you're having bumps, that you're gentle and kind with yourself. It's been a crazy ride, hasn't it? We will get through this. Just be gentle and kind with yourself and with others. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. <laughs>